For those of you that don't know, and I'm sure everybody knows, let's please welcome Richard Grieco today Thank to you. the Hamilton Comic Con. My name is Ward Anderson, and I'm going to be moderating this Q&A. We'll start off, uh, I'll ask a few questions and everything, and then we'll let people ask what they want to ask. How's that sound? Okay, cool. Very cool. Uh, first of all, welcome. You're uh, living out in L.A. Yeah. Right? And uh, you said uh, you said to me that you actually come this way a lot. Do you do a lot of the Do you do a lot of the conventions and things like that these days? Uh, you're still acting, still filming, yeah. so I know that takes you everywhere, and of course your artwork as well. Right. What's the thing that makes you travel the most? Is it Is it this sort of thing, or is it still um, filming? I don't try to do a lot of a lot of uh, comic cons just because I think if you do too many, you, you saturate the market. Mm -hmm. So I, I do maybe four or five a year. Because I enjoy the fans and people, you know. Um, as far as traveling, it's mostly uh, uh, filming, uh, especially producing a lot now and directing a lot now, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and also the uh, filming down in Canada is, uh, is is a good thing because of the the dollar to the Canadian dollar right now, mm -hmm. so you can get uh, more bang for your buck. Um, Absolutely. And uh, but yeah, I've been traveling around a lot. Um, I was in Australia about four months ago, um, prepping for a movie there, and then prepping for a movie now in Arizona. So, how do you like moving? I mean, you're always in front of the camera. You have been before acting, of course, modeling and everything. How do you like producing? How do you like being behind the camera? I think it was a, a kind of a natural progression for me because um, um, I, <clears throat> I worked with so many bad directors that were just horrible. I'm that. Uh, and this is at an early age, this is at like 19 years old. Um, they just didn't understand, because I came from theater. Mm -hmm. So they didn't un understand the subtext of what a scene's about as far as like, it's about the performance, it's not about the shot. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean, most of the time, especially when you're just between two people, you know. So, and um, always ask questions and, and, and try to learn and learn my apertures and all these things and this and that. and. Uh, and just uh, directing for me is just kind of like a blank canvas and kind of like a painting mm -hmm. anyway, so, yeah. What I find uh, interesting about watching your career and where you've come is, you know, here we are in Canada, you and I are both American, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm Canadian now, but I have a friend that uh, did a song on the If Looks Could Kill soundtrack. Oh, wow. Uh, Trickster was the name of the band. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Popular yeah. Uh, New Jersey yeah. hair band, right? Yeah. And Steve was his name. And I remember talking to him, uh, you know, like 15 years ago or something, and he said, uh, I still get these great royalty checks mm. from If Looks Could Kill. That's funny. Uh, 1991. Yeah. And uh, he said, I still get these great royalty checks from that because you don't realize that that movie is playing all the time around the world still at some point. And what he was talking about is your draw around the world. That, you know, we get so insular here in North America right, right. that we don't realize that, you know, you've got a hardcore fan base in all parts of Asia, Australia, like you were talking about. Yeah, Germany, Paris, yeah. Japan, China. Um, um, yeah, my... my uh it's funny, my popularity there, I, I think it was predicated on the fact that, that w when I did uh, 21 Jump Street, I played a character that, that wasn't on TV before because we started with the headband and the ripped jeans and the mm -hmm. leather jackets and stuff. And, and, uh, and that transcended big time in Europe, mm -hmm. you know, because they liked that kind of rebellious, you know, anti-Hollywood, you know, thing. And, and uh, I think and the funny thing about Europe, um, it, it, you're... Like in America and Canada, you're only as good as your last film. Mm -hmm. In Europe, they remember you and they still, you're still popular. You're still on a, once you hit it big in Europe, you're still at a level like this, yeah. which, is, which is really interesting. Why do you suppose that is? Do you think it's, it's less of a, you know, machine, money machine there and more of an art thing? I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't know. know. It's kind of like a, a that's a weird uh, quandary. I, I, I think, uh, if they invest in a, in a person or an actor or an, or an actress or, or a group, I, I think they, they kind of stay with that person. Or, or, yeah. or um, um, in America, <clears throat> there's so many people coming out. I mean, I don't know how many, 
people with music out there today that I have no idea who the hell they are yeah. or if they can sing or not. Um, Often not. They can. <laughs> yeah. And so, and that's why, like, even uh, like your tours today. I mean, um, it's all '80s and '90s bands, I and mean, those are the mm -hmm. bands that generate the money as far as the tour circuit. I've said that um, we're in a point now that I call, uh, and it's because of social media mm -hmm. and because everything is at your fingertips with the internet, right. I call it permanent nostalgia. I think mm -hmm. we're in this point of permanent nostalgia. Right. And you see it in the fact that uh, the most watched show on Netflix is Friends. Yeah. Right? And, and that's by younger viewers. Mm -hmm. It's people that are only now, you know, getting into their early 20s. Right. And Friends is the most watched show by them, by that age group, right? Yeah. So that's why you have these comebacks and everything that you're seeing, like bringing back Will and Grace or all these shows. Yeah, they've been talking about doing a, a Booker reboot. Yeah. Um, and my, my, my take on that was, because um, I'm 49, so my take on that was, well, do it in the essence of, like, do in the essence of, like, John Wick meets Taken and, and put, like, Booker in, in that realm. And where it's just a, a um, you know, all-out kick-ass assault, you know, throughout the whole thing, you know, and make it really character-driven. Yeah. Um, so they kind of like that idea, um, but also like um, 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 Stranger Things. I mean, that brought mm -hmm. back. But I fall after the '85. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, but that's crazy. I, I told um, my friend I would never watch that show, and I watched it. And I binge watched it for three days. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't not yeah. stop watching it. It yeah. was just really that good. You and I are about the same age, so it's, you know, watching shows like that where what I, what I like about Stranger Things and a lot of these things is um, they don't hit you over the head with the no, nostalgia. No. They just show it as it was. Yeah. Like the fact that they're drinking new Coke. Yeah. It's not put in your head, ooh, new Coke. Right. It's done just, they're just sipping Coke, right? Yeah. They, they don't think anything about it. And I like that because it seems like with a lot of stuff from the 80s, it, 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 for a long time, people made it hokey, and it became yeah. a gag, right? Where and I like it where it's just no, just show how it was then, right? Well, you think about the shows in the '80s, '80, especially like when you had Jump Street, which was back then. Well, well basically Fox. When we were on Fox, it was on. Um, you had Monday and Tuesday night on Fox, so yeah. I think you had Jump Street, Tracy Ullman. America's Most Wanted, Gary Shandling, and The Simpsons. I think that was... Married the, with Children. And Married with Children. Mm -hmm. So basically, and all those shows are great shows. Yeah. Um, classics. So we, we look at them now as classics. So we created a whole... And I mean, I remember ABC, CBS, and NBC used to laugh at Fox back then. You know yeah. what I mean? And but we came up with all these cool shows where, um, like, Jump Street, you know, basically was the precursor to... Nano two and all and friends and all those things, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So, um, uh, yeah, so it was an interesting time. What's what I think of uh, when I think of the early days of Fox mm -hmm. that you guys did that you don't see anymore is uh, on those Sunday and Monday nights. Mm -hmm. uh, it would begin with a cast member of one of the shows saying, oh, yeah. good evening and welcome to Fox. Yeah. Right? And you, you don't see to. that now, these ads for the network where yeah. people are like, you're watching Fox, you know, and you guys had to do that as yeah, part of Yeah, the... because I don't know what channel Fox was on in some places. It, yeah. It was like on channel 98 or something or whatever it was. Uh, but it's funny today because you have so much um, content and so many places to put content mm -hmm. that the, the market is so saturated with so much stuff. I mean, and um, the, the, there's a good thing about it and a, and a bad thing about it, I think. Um, the newer stuff coming out is saturated the market so much that, that you get a lot of crap, mm -hmm. a lot of crap. Um, um, you know, in between 20 shows, you'll get one or two good ones. But mm -hmm. back then, you only had four networks. Yeah. And, and, um, and that's it. And if you were on, for some reason, basic cable, it's not like now. Like if you were on FX now, people right. go, ooh, you're on FX. If you were on basic cable somewhere, they were like, oh yeah, there's that show. <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> you, show. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. There were shows on Showtime that yeah. we look back on and people don't even remember them. Yeah. And I, you know, and, but now if you get on one of the cable networks, it's considered this big deal. Yeah, because I did a, an episode of Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and they wanted me to do that for a couple, a couple of years. And I finally said yes, because they wanted them to come up with a cool 
Well, I was playing myself again, yeah. which I seem to do that a lot. And, uh, and so we came up with, me and Charlie came up with a cool idea. You know, so that was fun. Do you like doing that? Do you like playing, you know, character version of yourself? Or do you, you know, you want to spend more time moving into, not moving it, into, it, but staying in regular acting? It's fun um, playing self-defecating characters where you kind of make fun of yourself. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I mean, Night at the Roxbury, um, um, I remember I gained 25 pounds for the movie. Mm -hmm. You know, then I remember Lauren Michaels and, 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 uh, and all the heads of the studios were like, what the, what the hell did you do? I mean, and I said, well, if I'm playing myself, like 15 years down the road, and basically all I'm doing in the movie is partying, you yeah. know? I mean, so they said, well, how'd you do it? I said, for the past six months, I've just been partying. <laughs> you know, so. You're a method actor. So that's what I did, and, and I think it worked. I, I really do, I think it worked. Yeah, absolutely. Character, so. Let's, um, let's go back to Booker for a second. I want to talk about that, because what I always found interesting about the Booker character, so he comes in in season three mm -hmm. of 21 Jump Street, right. and interestingly enough, Booker becomes this breakout character, mm -hmm. but you know, the, the 21 Jump Street was my favorite show at the time. I was right. in that age group. I was mm -hmm. you know, exactly who it was targeted towards. Right. And I look back and I go, it's funny because Booker was a villain yeah. in some ways. Yeah. Like when he first debuted, he was internal affairs, yeah. he was there to spy on people. Uh, Johnny Depp's character, Tom Hansen, mm. hated him, right. didn't like him. Mm. And I look back at it now, and I, I've never really known, was it intended for Booker to be there the full season, or was that originally no. he was gonna kind of drop in and go out? Okay, my first day of walking on the on table read at 21 Jump Street, so it was, a round table, it was Steve Beers, Bill Nuss, Johnny, Dustin, Holly, Peter, and a couple of the writers. So, I, so they were looking at the script, I haven't got there yet. They're looking at the script, they're like. And then Steve looks up, he goes, are there kids in this room? And he goes, who the fuck are you? <laughs> I go, I don't know, I'm just here playing, I think the Booker character. And what Fox saw the dailies of, of the stuff between me and Depp. Mm -hmm. um, we, he, the, they knew that, that there was an animosity between us already, yeah. period. Um, and what they did was, on their promos, they did it kind of like a WWE thing where they did a Greco Depp, Depp, Greco, Greco yeah. Depp, and that launched that show to even bigger heights. And so it also... Um, and season three was the highest rated season. Yeah, and also it enabled those characters to actually hate each other you know, yeah. on the show. You know? and, uh, and plus, you, I mean, it got you chummy chummy. You need, I mean, look at, I mean, if you, if you didn't have Darth Vader in Star Wars, I mean, Star Wars would suck, yeah. you know? So I, I, it needed an antagonist, someone to kind of ruffle people's feathers, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, and they did, and plus, there are certain shows that, that Depp wouldn't do, um, like the talk radio one. Yeah. Because he thought it was racist. I said, well, it's only racist if you look at it in a literal point of view. Mm -hmm. If you look at it in a metaphor of explaining what racism is about, mm -hmm. and this guy all of a sudden being engulfed in it, and all of a sudden doesn't know if he is or not, or this and that, and, and use that dichotomy, then it's a character piece. Yeah. So you can't, I mean, so. For those who may not remember, uh, it's an episode where Booker goes undercover in a university and becomes a, a kind of a local Rush Limbaugh type talk right. radio hero on campus as they're investigating. Mario Van Peebles was Mario, in that episode with you. Yeah, I got Mar I was supposed to do, um, um, there was a movie called um, Gassing Cowboys, and that was supposed to be my first movie. And I told them I wanted Mario Van Peebles to direct it, it was mm -hmm. a Fox. And then Warner Brothers came along at the same time, offered me a Flux Could Kill. Mm -hmm. um, so I remember I finally turned down the one at Fox, but got Mario up there in Fox, which he, he ended up directing New Jack City. Yeah. And I ended up doing um, that one. It Looks Could Kill. Well, I'm working with Bill again next week, starting Whack the Don. Really? Yeah. That's great. Yeah. You, um, 
I've heard you say before that uh, one of your inspirations, biggest inspirations, was Marlon Brando, oh. and you love the Brando pause. Mm. Uh, you know, th this is going back 20 years when I think I read that. Mm. Uh, still, one of your inspirations, you still look back on Brando as part of what inspired you? Yeah, I, I think Brando, um, Montgomery Cliff, and Dean back then, when I'm, I mean, I started a jump shoot when I was 19, mm -hmm. so, um, and also Chaplin, I was a big fan of Chaplin and, and, uh, and, uh, and Valentino, um, but, but Brando had a, a, a style, I mean, he was, he was a method actor, but he, he brought the Stanislavski um, thing to, a, to another level. Yeah. Where Vivian Lee and stuff were all big, and you know this and that, and, and uh, it was more organic and and, uh, and more uh, real, you know. So uh, so yeah, he had a. I met him like um, a couple of times too. I couldn't talk. I met him because I was too nervous. But he came up to me and gave me a big hug, and you know that was really neat. So. What do you suppose? You know, it, it still has cult status, and I saw it still plays randomly around the world, but what do you suppose happened with Booker only getting the one, one season? What I'll do you suppose? I'll tell you what happened. Um, I mean, this is all political shit, but uh, you had Fox, and you had um, Cannell. <clears throat> you had Barry Diller at Fox. You had Peter Chernin head of Fox. So you had Barry Diller owned Fox. Peter Chernin was the head of Fox. Um, Booker was getting better ratings than Jump Street, okay? Cannell wanted, Fox wanted Cannell's, all of Cannell's foreign rights with Booker and 21 Jump Street. Mm -hmm. The creator Cannell, of 21 Jump Street, for yeah. those that don't know. And he also created Wise Guy and, I mean, all these shows. Um, yeah. And Cannell said no, so if you notice that year, they canceled Booker and Jump Street at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't good at rating, ratings, it wasn't because of anything, it was just of that really yeah. rights politics mm -hmm. things like that yeah what i found interesting to watch over the past several years it took a long time for jump street and booker to find their way to home video release and everything because right. the music rights yeah because rights. and that was something that fox was doing and mm -hmm. jump street and booker were doing that was really ahead of the curve yeah. is that they were finding music you know right up until that point the mid to late 80s Music was often um, royalty-free, kind of right. canned music. And if there was a popular song, it was a re-record. It would be right. like a sound-alike. You know, I saw Knight Rider recently, and all the right. music in that is, you know, someone else singing, where Jump Street and Booker used if you think about artists the, of the day. If you think about the songs we use in those yeah. shows, I mean, from Blind Faith to Simple Minds to... R.E.M. R.E.M. to, I mean, we used, I mean, major songs. Yeah. And right as they were hitting. And, and, yeah. and both those shows helped those songs uh, to become the, hits. Uh, especially the R.E.M. song, um, Stan. Yeah. I mean, that helped make that song a top ten hit. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so interesting because in so many ways that's one of the reasons that these shows stood out yeah. with our generation and it was so big and at the same time it's it's one of those things that has i don't want to say screwed it but it's held it back yeah, held it when back. it comes to the video release because i i don't believe any of the home releases have the original music like most of the music yeah. has had to be changed and and it's the only one that does um the theme song to book with billy idol yeah. i mean because I, I was friends with billy and 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 uh and he did the the song he was he was cool with it so yeah because that would have held us up big time yeah you know without that song you know you don't like to slow down i noticed that mm. because you know you're directing and producing uh f with everybody you know you've worked yeah. with all kinds of companies we both have worked with the asylum and oh yeah i've worked with, yeah, like yeah. that yeah. Uh, I, I write for them <laughs> you've worked with but them david and paul great i love david and paul good I guys mean, they're good guys talk yeah. about work ethic and they, and they look at everything like it's fun mm -hmm. It's not Shakespeare, mm -hmm. you know, let's just have fun. Um, we know it's schlocky, but let's do the best we can with it. But, but you, know? you know what, I, th I think when you embrace that, nah. your audience embraces it too. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, they everyone has good, fun with it. They want a product that's kind of like campy, yeah. you know. And, uh, Absolutely. So, yeah. But uh, before we get to questions from anybody else here, I, I do want to talk about your artwork because, uh, you know, you've described it, uh, some people would call it abstract, you've described it um, 
as um, well, I, I, I described it as abstract emotionalism because yeah. I, you know with with uh, Klimp and de Kooning and, and Pollock and and Klein and, and and all those guys in the in the 30s 40s 50s um, um, the, everything was abstract expressionism but but I thought that that basically they were pouring emotions on a canvas um, and, it, and it was an unbridled emotion so I, I just think they coined that back then because expressionism was already a thing mm -hmm. so um, I came up with abstract emotionalism which I coined that phrase because that's what I thought they were doing anyways sure. it just they just put it in a niche so yeah. how long have you been painting how long has that been going on now I was painting since 1987 right um, I did Dennis Hopper became a big fan of my artwork. Um, and I did a movie with him called The Apostate um, mm -hmm. in 2001. And he's the one that told me, you know, that your work's different. Um, there's nothing like it around. You gotta make it public, because it's not about you. You know, it's about them. You know, you can keep, it's like keeping all your feelings to yourself your whole life and never telling any, anybody about it. So you gotta get your work out there. And, and I finally did in 2009, but unfortunately Dennis already passed away. Mm -hmm. But um, no, he's, he's basically the guy that told me to, to uh, gave me the kick in the ass to get out there. Is it therapeutic for you? Is that like a way for you to relax, yeah. take yeah, the edge off? Yeah, I write all the time too, but sometimes your brain moves really quickly and you can't write that fast. And a lot of times I'll write and the next day I can't understand a word I said, you know, what I wrote down. So. Yeah. Painting is cathartic in a way. Um, it, it's emotional. It's draining. Um, I took four years off about five years ago. Just to, I just painted, yeah. you know. And there, you know, I'd go a month sometimes just painting one piece. A lot of pieces, are, you know, like this big, you know, big pieces. So, did you bring any to the con? No, no. Too much to travel with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, just real quick, just because I was always a fan, tell me about Mobsters, about working on that. It was great. I mean, because we were all so young, um, Mobsters, uh, for one thing, it was, it was Kazan's son that wrote the script, mm -hmm. you know, and obviously we were all a fan of Billy Kazan because of East of Eden and, and stuff. And, and, uh, and the, the first draft was 221 pages, which is yeah, you know, two, three-hour movie. The script and is we, usually about ninety pages. Yeah, <laughs> but we shot for six months. Um, I remember. Uh, and that's uh, a long shoot too. Long shoot. Yeah. Um, and working with, uh, I mean, Christian Patrick Costas. We we're the, we we're all kids, uh, but working with F. Murray Abraham, Abraham uh, Michael Gambon, um, you know, uh, Anthony Quinn. Anthony Quinn. Um, it was, I mean, he, he was, he's just bigger than life, you know. I mean, his lines that were on the page never got done screen because he'd say his own shit. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, I mean, that was back in the day where we used real guns, you know, real full loads. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, shoot those Thompsons. And also getting into the character with the accents and, and and the mannerisms, and I got to know the Siegel family that were that were still alive and yeah. stuff. And, and you're only like what one of five actors to play Bugsy Siegel, yeah. something like that. Yeah. So I mean, you know, that's that's something that I think is so cool, being a part of history, playing a historical figure, but only being like one of a handful yeah. to have done it. And everyone's done it differently. Everyone's played him differently because because truthfully, different. no one really. You know, you look back at figures like that, like, sure, there's photos and there's an old right. screen test from him, but no yeah. one really knows exactly no. what he was like or, no. or mannerisms or things like that. They mm -hmm. only go off of, you know, word of mouth. age 41, you know, where you should. But, I, but when Warren was doing his, because uh, um, uh, Bugsy and Mobsters were being shot at the same time. So I used to say, you know, well, at least mine is, is the right age. You know? <laughs> that was uh, you know, one I, thing I remember when, I when Warren Beatty's Bugsy came out. I remember saying, I think, I think Warren Beatty was in his late 50s at the time <laughs> or something when he did 60s. it. Early 60s. Was he yeah. 60s already? Yeah. yeah. So, and, 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 yeah. and Bugsy Siegel died at 41. 41. Yeah. So uh, 
why don't we open up for questions? Anybody have anything they'd like to ask Mr. Grieco? And of course, he will be signing autographs around the corner uh, on, on Celebrity Row, as we call it. So make sure you go by there. You've got uh, a ton of photos and things like that. Oh, yeah, yeah tons of photos and, and photo ops and everything. Yeah. Make sure you do that. Honestly, the one I brought up was talk radio because I got so involved with that um, as a character. It was really tough to do because when you're even acting, when you're in a room alone, like and you've got a mic like this, and you can hear yourself, and you can manipulate your voice as you talk, you know, and and you're reading dialogue that is that is really truly um, offensive, and and you start believing in it. And it's really strange, it's a weird cathartic thing and a weird subconscious kind of, um, I don't know, mind fuck. Oh, the kid's, the kid's back there. Um, but uh, I think that one was, and also the bully bully one was just fun because that was just about bullies and how we did when we were high school and stuff like that. Um, this is of course where the geeks at the end try to go to yeah. the gym and you tell them they don't need to. Yeah. Or they, they try to become bodybuilders and you and go, I'm smoking a cigarette. Cool. And you're smoking in it, yeah. And that was Booker a, smoked. That was the last original, uh, um, um, last character that was a, a regular in a series to smoke. And Fox thought Cannon was getting a kickback from Marlboro. Huh. So we had to do a whole episode on me quitting smoking. So they actually spent $2.5 million on an episode of me quitting smoking. Just, but if you notice, even after that episode, I quit smoking, like I, we'd be interrogating a guy like, like in a thing and he'd have a cigarette and I'd walk, I'd like walk by and he'd have a cigarette in bed. <laughs> steal the cigarette and put it back? Put it back. <laughs> Anything I can get away with, you know? In the Booker reboot, Booker will vape. No, he won't vape. He'll, he'll <laughs> smoke. No, he'll, he'll smoke. The, um, I, I want to say that episode, the talk radio episode, and I guess it was probably 1989, I guess, 88 or yeah. 89, that one. 89. Uh, the reason I remember it so well is that that's been my job. I've worked in talk radio mm. for right. so many years, and I remember telling my co-host of my last mm. show on Sirius XM, I said... What was funny about that episode is how timeless it is today, because all the things that are said in there, uh, the producer of uh, Booker's show mm. says, like, it doesn't matter if you believe it. It doesn't matter how true right. it is. It matters how you sell it, and it matters if it gets right. them listening. And if it gets them angry, that's even better. Yeah. That's still true today when mm. it comes to talk radio, how much of that, you'll be surprised how many talk radio people you meet, that you'll hear them on the radio like, <laughs> And right. then you meet them off the air and they're like, hey, buddy, what's going right, on? Right. Because it is another form of, uh, enter it's entertainment, yeah. but it's also sales. It's yeah. selling that product to people to get right, them. Right. The average talk radio host or a talk radio listener listens. Mm -hmm. If they like the host and agree with them, mm -hmm. they listen for 30 minutes. If they don't and they make them, it makes them angry, they listen for 90. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so, Crazy. and they, and that's something that was on that show. Yeah. I also like the, um, the, the 21 Drum Street episode that you guys did with uh, in the art school, where oh I did my um, you my, got to give your monologue at the my end my monologue my something haiku my whatever it was where yeah. I, I smashed the TV with a sledgehammer yeah a lot of stuff. What's yeah. your favorite episode of Booker? Um, Molly and Eddie was really cool. Um, uh, just because because the girl was so great in it. I, I also, um, the one where Laura, uh, Lara Turney came back as my girlfriend mm -hmm. and that whole emotional thing. Uh, I think um, the one show where Booker was going off the rails, um, which was called, uh, what was the name of that episode? Um, um, is it the BB King episode? No, Summer Stole a Seal was just a ball. What? That was just a ball to do. Yeah. Because we were supposed to have BB King on, on the episode. Um, we got his voice, but he, he was ill. Yeah. So we got two of his guitars. I still have one of them. For those that don't know, it's an episode where Booker has to chase down Lucille, BB King's 
guitar. legendary guitar because it's been stolen. Yeah. Uh, an episode that they can't rerun in uh, many places because Lucille is also, much like the music, yeah. Lucille is trademarked. Is trademarked. And so I think it took them a long time to get the rights to release that on DVD yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Sir. I think one of one um, other than me, other than him, um, I think Lori Petty on Booker. I mean, and I'll be honest with you that they, when she got on, um, it was supposed to be a one-off, and but she, but she became so popular. But Fox didn't want her on because they thought we looked. It was too similar, it looked almost like a brother sister thing, you know. Um, her, I think. Um, um, uh, Gabrielle Anwar, uh, great chemistry with her in, in Looks Could Kill. Um, um, Dennis Hopper, um, I don't know if you guys ever saw, I mean, Mike, uh, it was called The Apostate. Really good film. And also, another film is um, Manhattan Midnight with Maggie Q. Um, and uh, had a, that was her first American film, so I had a really good chemistry with her. You know. Some of you. Are, are younger than, than we are, so I do recommend you find If Looks Could Kill if you have not seen it. I, it's a James Bond spoof, yeah. and uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, um, I told you about the, the soundtrack and everything. The reason, uh, I, this is a soft spot for me, I'll tell you, I'll geek out for a second, but a uh, girlfriend in high school uh, dumped me. Mm -hmm. We were supposed to go to the movies that night, she dumped me, right. and I went by myself. And I went oh, and really? saw, she didn't want to see if looks could kill. She wanted to see something else. Oh. So I went and saw if looks could kill by myself. That's funny. And after the movie, I went to the local record store and I bought the soundtrack because I like the soundtrack. Produced by Canadians, Canada's David Foster. Yeah, David Foster. Yep. And, I, uh, and then I met the girl I wound up dating for like the next year who worked oh, at the record awesome. store. Yeah, so there you go. Thank you for my pleasure. introducing me to the woman who took my virginity. Uh, any, other, <laughs> any other questions? All right, um, we don't want to take up too much of your time. I know you got to go back and do a lot of meet and greets and everything like that, but uh, what do you say we give them a round of applause? Thank you guys, you guys have been great. Best of luck with everything you got going on. Appreciate it, bro.